time in over 700 years. This medieval skeleton is one of three unearthed on the site of the Old Town Cinema. Because it stands in the shadow of Malmesbury Abbey, this was probably an old burial ground, but now it's destined for new homes. Well, I must admit, when the phone, phone call came through from my site manager, I, I just couldn't believe it. And actually, I thought that somebody was joking. If it had been the 1st of April, I think that would have been it. But no, I, was, I, I literally came up from our office in Bath and shot up here and you know, found it very, very interesting. Most of the burial ground was disturbed when the old cinema was built in the 1930s. But the skeletons have survived in excellent condition. Archaeologists will now be trying to find out more about them before they're reburied. We know that they are related to the, to the abbey in, in some form or, or other. Um, we're evidently Christians. Um, they're certainly laid out east-west, which is a traditional Christian burial rite. And I personally think we're not going to find an awful lot out about them. There's only three of them. And that the, the proper and decent thing to do is, is to, to rebury them in the Christian fashion. But the bones have certainly caused a stir in Malmesbury. The local hairdressers opposite the site, who have been inundated with visitors since the remains were found, were given their own guided tour this morning. Oh, I just think it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I've always been interested in it and I wanted to come over and help them dig. <laughs> when you see people picking up bones and putting them in the bags, um, you know, our prices have just gone up. <laughs> Do you think it's a bit creepy? Um, I wouldn't say it's creepy as such, but it's... No, it's really interesting to find out how long it's actually been here and it makes you wonder whether it's all around and like, underneath a shop. And when the building work starts again, the archaeologists will be keeping a close eye on the diggers, just in case. Well, you can see behind me the building site is all secure now for the night. With me is the Mayor of Malmesbury, Councillor John Bowen. John, Malmesbury's got a few skeletons in its covers, I'm sure we've heard the gossip, and the old gags are the best, but you never thought you had this here, did you? No, not at all. Um, we knew something was potentially beneath it, because it is the old site of one of the old chapels, um, but an, an archaeological dig was done two years ago and nothing was found at all, so it really was very exciting to, to find the present burials. And what was here? What do we know? We know the cinema was here since the 30s, but you know, hundreds of years ago, what was on the site? There was a, a relocated entrance to the abbey um, in 1285 and there had been on the site, probably since the Anglo-Saxon times, a very, very early chapel and probably dedicated to St Michael, which is a very early dedication. And um, it was still standing in 1542, so um, the fact that there's some burials very near or even in it it's very exciting. And what do, who do you think these people are? Do you think they were actually attached to the Abbey or perhaps townspeople? Almost certainly they were affiliated to the Abbey because it's inside the Abbey precincts. The Abbey gateway is literally only a matter of yards from here. Um, and as that is the case, I would imagine that it is more likely to be lay brethren or people affiliated directly with the corp of the Abbey itself. And very briefly, John, it's caused a bit of a stir. People like this story, don't they? Yeah. Uh, enormously, because we always like bones. Um, Malmesbury is not full of dry bones. It's full of um, total uh, excitement and this is a bit for the um, Times people now. John, thanks for doing John Bowen, the Mayor of Malmesbury. Has caused some fun, but it will be the, the, the bones will be uh, brought up very shortly and houses will be on this side by March. Back to you. Mm, thanks, Steve. Uh, I reckon they're left over from the back row of the cinema. <laughs> for the world's top pilots, it was back to the day job, leaving the organisers to face a barrage of complaints from punters. With more visitors than ever before, the organisers say this year was a huge success. But for many of the 200,000 who came to Fairford, it was a weekend of utter misery and irritation. The reason? Extra tight security, with armed police and guards at every entry point on the base. Even up at Heathrow Airport, I work at the airport and there's not this much security. This is an air show, it's a family day out, it's not, a, you know, it's an absolute shambles. It's last year I'll come here. For many, the frustration started before they got anywhere near the airfield. At one point, the traffic tailed back 15 miles to the M4 near Swindon. One man told us that it took him four hours to travel one and a half miles. We were in fact surprised by the unprecedented number of cars that came and the improvements we tried to put in place, in fact the roads got clogged anyway. We've got to do something about it next year and we'll be getting together and trying to sort something out between ourselves and the local police. Residents in the surrounding villages were given special passes to allow them to move around. That didn't work either. We tried to turn off um, somewhere, I think it's into Marston Maisie and we couldn't get through, the police just wouldn't let us through even though we're a resident and we needed to get there. Inside the wire, the show went on regardless, although for several hours on Saturday, all displays were cancelled. After this, Italian transport plane came to a grinding halt after its landing gear collapsed when it touched down. This incident, along with the traffic chaos and the security hold-ups, 
will now be the subject of an internal inquiry by the organisers of Europe's largest air show. Derek Tedder, HTV News at RAF Fairford. flying high. This week we're going on quite a short trip but it's going to be a really interesting one. We're starting off in the east of our region at Malmesbury and loosely following the line of the River Avon all the way down to Avonmouth Docks. Now that means of course we take in the great cities of Bath and Bristol, our most densely populated part of the region. Chances are we'll fly over your house, your school or place of work so keep your eyes peeled. And that man BJ's got me worried again. What on earth is he doing? What are you doing BJ? <laughs> I'm just listening for creaking noises. <laughs> this worries me, you know. And if you hear a creaking noise... We won't be flying. Is this a sort of a, a routine sort of safety check you have yeah, to do before yeah, each flight? Literally every, every day, every day before every flight, yeah. Can you hear a creaking noise? Nope. And how good's your hearing? Hey. Oh, he thinks that's funny. <laughs> Makes me nervous. Well, assuming that the uh, tail rotor doesn't uh, drop off, here's the plan for today. Let's take a look at the map. We start in Malmesbury. This area here, the big circle, that's the RAF line and control area. Now, good news, we've got special permission from the RAF to fly right over the top of the base at line, and that should be fascinating to see the big Hercules there. We then take a line southwest, we have a look at the River Avon, we're going to go over the Kennet and Avon Canal. When we get to the sort of Winsley, Bradford on Avon area, we've got to zoom over to Bristol Airport. Here, we hope to get permission to fly down the runway. Once we've filled up with fuel, we're going to come back into the heart of Bath. The town of Malmesbury is the oldest borough in England and was created by King Alfred the Great. The name borough derives from the Saxon word burg and the old cake burner created 112 of them. Dominating the town today is the abbey which was founded in 675 AD though nothing remains of that period. It's also thought that the first true English king Athelstan was buried here in 939 AD. What we see today is basically a medieval monastery. At the time of the dissolution of the monasteries, Henry VIII sold some of the buildings to a local cloth merchant. This Hercules aircraft is on a low-level training mission and stationed at RAF Lynham to the east of Chippenham. At the outbreak of war in 1939, Lynham was built as a maintenance unit and then a flying training school. But its real purpose was soon to become RAF Transport Command. The airfield is now home to the entire Hercules force of 54 aircraft. From the Berlin airlift to the Gulf War, the squadron has delivered the backup needed. The Fat Alberts, as they're known affectionately, also have a fine record for delivering humanitarian aid right across the world. This was once part of the Great Western Railway, or as it was known at the time, God's Wonderful Railway. And if one person was said to symbolise the inventiveness of the early Victorian age, it must be the engineer who built this line. Isambard Kingdom Brunel. At Chippenham, the power and influence of steam can be clearly seen. Brunel not only drove the railway straight through the town, but also lifted it up to keep the gradient level. The Victorians built on a scale never seen before anywhere in the world. How many people on this train realize that the tunnel, which has just cut off their mobile, was built 150 years ago? Railways enabled people to move around the country quickly, efficiently, and above all, cheaply. Something you can't say today. To the east of the Avon is this beautiful 18th century landscape park at Bowood House. This was designed by the most famous garden designer of the day, Capability Brown. 
who was actually called Lancelot Brown, but was known as Capability because he used to say to potential clients that there was a great capability for improvement. His natural settings were often highly contrived. Streams were dammed, lakes dug, hills created, and hundreds of trees carefully placed to create just the right effect. At Bowood, there's a fine classical temple, as well as a cascade that Brown designed as a runoff from the lake he created. The house itself was built around 1720 and was reduced in size when part of it was demolished in 1955. It's still the home of the Lansdowne family, close friends of Prince Charles. To the west and on the banks of the Avon is a beautiful converted monastery. Unlike Malmesbury Abbey, which fell into ruin after Henry VIII destroyed it, Laycock Abbey was turned into a house in the 1540s and incorporated much of the original monastery. Laycock is perhaps best known for being the home of William Fox Talbot, one of the pioneers of early photography and inventor of the modern photographic negative. Today, the house is owned by the National Trust, who also look after the estate village next to the house, which dates from the 13th century. If the village looks familiar, it is. It's been the location for many period films, such as Pride and Prejudice, as well as Harry Potter. Canals and rivers provided the most efficient transport links at the end of the 18th century, as well as supplying all the power needed to run the mills that lined the banks of the river here at Bradford-on-Avon. Once steam had been pioneered, the mills and factories could be built anywhere, and places like Bradford began to decline. also declined with the advent of steam as new railway lines began to spread across the country. Railway companies often bought up land close to canals and then took away their business. To the west of Bradford-on-Avon, the river and canal come together along with the railway as they funnel through a valley. In order to keep the canal level, a classical looking aqueduct takes it across the river and railway. Three miles further on, it crosses back over again. In a small valley to the south is Eiford Manor a Tudor house with a later classical facade and a wonderful garden. In 1898, an architect, Harold Peter, lived here and created the unique garden we can see below us. He took his inspiration from Italy. He terraced the slopes and built steps to link the different levels. There are fountains, pools, classical statues, figures, urns and colonnades and garden summer houses. Roses, wisteria and climbers soften the strong lines of the architectural features. This Italian-style garden is in great contrast to the English water meadows along the valley floor below. Close to Eiford Manor is Farley Hungerford Castle. It was built in the 14th century and amongst the ruins is a beautiful small chapel. And buried inside is Sir Thomas Hungerford who built the castle. From here, it's almost possible to see the city of Bath, but before we can get there, we have to head off to Bristol and refuel. Well, I've flown from Bristol many times before, but never had a view quite like this. Join me after the break when we take a close look at the great cities of Bristol and Bath.
Welcome back to Flying High. Now that the holidaymakers have taken off, the Bristol Control Tower can give us permission to taxi to the main runway and then take off towards the city of Bath. High on Lansdowne Hill, overlooking the city of Bath, is a remarkable building known as Beckford's Tower. William Beckford was born a rich man and was once heard to say, so I am growing rich and mean to build towers. In 1827, he bought land behind his house in Bath to build a library and a 120 foot high tower. And after the viewing room was added, thought, nope, higher. And so a golden lantern was added to the top. Today, the tower is open to the public who can climb up and admire the view over one of Europe's most beautiful cities. sunlight the city stands out like a beacon as the bath stone turns a beautiful honey color we can start our flight at almost ground level as the city has given us permission to come in low over the famous rugby ground in front of us dominating the city center is the magnificent abbey built around 1499 it's said that the bishop had a powerful vision of angels assisting the building. Close by the abbey is the reason Bath exists, the hot springs. They were discovered back in Celtic Britain and dedicated to the god Saul. What we see today are the Roman baths developed around 43 AD. They called the spa Aquae Sulis and they built this great bath, which once had a roof, so well that the hot water still flows through a lead pipe installed by a Roman plumber. The bath we see today is the result of a group of men who decided to develop the hot springs in the early 18th century into a fashionable place to visit and to be seen. They were to create the perfect classical city built out of the beautiful, mellow bath stone. The first major construction was Queen Square by the architect John Wood. Each side seems to represent one large classical house, though divided into terraced houses. This was a pretty new design for the time and began to attract rich and influential clients. John Wood then designed Prior Park for one of Bath's founders, Ralph Allen. Standing high on a hill overlooking the city, this great classical house was like a wonderful advertisement for Bath and the stone it was built with. The park, which drops away from the house, was landscaped by Capability Brown. The house is now a private school, but the park, with its beautiful bridge, belongs to the National Trust and is open to visitors. The next major development was the circus just north of Queen Square. The inspiration for these 33 classical houses came from the Colosseum Arena in Rome. Once again, this was a design not seen before and added to the prestige of Bath. A few years later, a great curving terrace was added to the west, the Royal Crescent. This is one of the finest pieces of town planning ever devised. The 30 houses stand in a semi-elliptical curve, clearly visible from the air. The crescent is tied together as a uniform design by the large columns. These were large houses, and number one Royal Crescent, now a museum, is a mansion in its own right. the reason for coming to Bath was to take the waters and you did this in the pump room close to the Abbey. Three glasses of the rather nasty tasting water were recommended 
but the real reason for going was to see and be seen by other fashionable folk. Once the uh, medicine had been taken, the rest of the day could be spent entirely in pleasure. The assembly rooms offered a place for tea and gossip and a ballroom for dances in the evening. Still does. During the day, there might be a carriage drive down the impressive Pulteney Street. It's over 100 feet wide and ends with a bridge designed by the famous architect Robert Adam. It's based on a Renaissance bridge in Florence and has shops on either side so that people have no idea they're crossing a bridge. As time went by, other great curving crescents were added up the side of the hill as Bath became more and more fashionable. Houses in the sinuous curve of Lansdowne Crescent offered fantastic views across the city and I think give Royal Crescent a run for its money. Bath is a unique city and a world heritage site. It's probably more popular today than it's ever been before and attracts visitors from across the world. At 10 to 7 in the evening on Sunday the 24th of November 1940, German bombers emerged from the clouds and it devastated Bristol. Hitler boasted that he had totally destroyed the city and docks. He nearly had. The Lord Mayor at the time said the city of churches had in one night become the city of ruins. Looking down on the heart of the city at all the post-war building, it's easy to see what damage had been done. Today, the docks are no longer full of cargo ships, but new uses have been found for the quaysides in offices, public buildings, pubs and so on. Modern Bristol has changed from its 19th century industrial past, but it's not been forgotten. One man, whose railway we saw earlier, firmly established himself here in Bristol, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He was not only a brilliant railway engineer, he also built stations. The old terminal at Temple Meads in Bristol is built like a medieval hall. Over the train shed is an arched wooden roof larger than the old hall at Westminster. The Gothic design was also used when the station was enlarged. Such a grand building shows the importance that railways had in the Victorian age. Not content with railways and stations, Brunel also designed the largest metal ship in the world, the SS Great Britain now back in the same Bristol dock where it was originally built. It was also the world's first propeller-driven ship. On her maiden voyage, she steamed to America in 14 days and no longer had to rely on favourable winds that sailing ships needed for a fast journey. Perhaps the best example of Brunel's genius is the Clifton Suspension Bridge across the Avon Gorge. When work began in 1830, it was to be the longest single-span bridge in the world at 630 feet. At the time, many said it couldn't be built, and as ever, there was a shortage of funds. In fact, Brunel never saw the bridge finished. He died in 1859, and it was left to some of his colleagues to finish his masterpiece. It was finally opened in 1864, and is one of the great engineering feats of its day. The Victorians built on a dramatic scale, 
and it was meant to last. Bristol was an important port, and some of the old warehouses that survived wartime damage, as well as more modern demolition, stand as a testament to the success of the port. At the end of the 18th century, the prosperous merchants began to move up to Clifton into brand new elegant squares and crescents. One of the larger houses is Goldney, where there is a fine garden overlooking the city and harbour. This belonged to a rich businessman, Thomas Goldney, who perhaps watched his ships come and go as he counted his profit. But during the 19th century, Bristol lost out to Liverpool as the leading port and the docks went into steep decline. The main reason was the 30-foot rise and fall of the tide, which made it very difficult for the now larger ships to not only dock successfully, but also navigate along the Avon Gorge. In the 1870s, a decision was made to move the docks to Avonmouth and revive Bristol as a major port. is now one of Britain's key ports. Over 12 million tonnes comes and goes through the two ports, the other being Royal Portbury Dock on the south bank of the Avon. The deep water harbour means larger ships can dock. Giant cranes handle containers, stacking them like small boxes. and some pupils then. Uh, Malcolm Trobe, the head of Malmesbury Comprehensive in Wiltshire. Hello, Malcolm. Good morning, Victoria. And Jonathan Jones and Sally Hopkins, both 15. Uh, both just finished the first year of their GCSEs. Morning to you both. Morning. Morning. What do you think, Malcolm? I, I'm very pleased about, uh, about the possible changes because I think what we really need is, is a curriculum which is accessible to, to all students and a curriculum that enables all students to get some success from it. We, what we've got to do is to find um, a curriculum which enables all youngsters to, to gain in self-esteem and have you know, a, a practical element to it. Can you explain what a baccalaureate is and, and why it would do what you've you think it will do? I think they're trying to move away from the, the term baccalaureate because the baccalaureate is associated with, with, with the current international baccalaureate and they're looking at a different term for it, uh, an overarching diploma. Mm -hmm. The idea is that it takes into account everything that a student does. So it'll build in aspects such as community service, the work that they, they do in extracurricular activities, their drama, the sport, their arts, their music. It'll build in also paid employment, any voluntary work they do to ensure that, that you, you see the full breadth. And you and still take exams? You, you still take exams yes, in the various they, subjects? Yeah, the idea, I think, is that they, they will still take exams. And I think the idea is that the GCSEs and the A-levels will form part of the programme. 
but there will be a move away from lots of more written papers and, and on to the idea of a lot more internal assessment. Sounds like it's going to be easier. Something I don't understand. Can I, can uh, I ask a question? Sorry, uh, there's something I don't understand about morning, this. Morning, Nicky. Morning to you. How, will, will there still be will it, a clear differentiation between the excellent students, uh, the quite good students and the not so good students? I think so. Yeah, there'll I be think, four, four I, levels it, it, that you can attain. I think you, you, you actually can, you could, you, you, because not every student will be doing the same thing. I think the difficulty is, is getting equivalence, and it always has been a bit of a problem, is to say, uh, is, is a vocational program, say, for example, in, in engineering or, or in business or in construction, the same value as GCSEs in, in say, history or geography? There's always been that difficulty, and I think that's the, that's the one issue that they have to clearly address. Uh, Sally and Jonathan, then, um, are you planning to stay on for, to do A-levels? Yes. Yeah, I am. And um, what about you, Jonathan? Uh, yeah, I'll definitely stay on and do A-levels. Right, so uh, from what you've heard, would you rather be doing this single diploma than uh, the various A-levels that you'll be doing? Well, AS and A-levels is sort of two exams in two years. Um, which I hear from other A-level students is, is not a pleasant experience. So, yeah, I'd rather be doing the diploma. Mm. Sally? Yeah, I think I'd rather be doing the pl diploma as well. I think um, it's an easier thing in a one way that you don't have, if they've got the modules, you don't have to keep revi revisiting subject parts of subjects on the second year of your exams. And it will also include any extracurricular activities you do. And I gather, Jonathan, you're really interested in drama. You were nearly, nearly in Harry Potter, is that right? Got, got the wrong one. You weren't nearly in that Harry That was the other Jonathan that we had lined up, I'm afraid. Oh, sorry. No one told me there were two Jonathans and we were having Jonathan B. Sorry about that. So, so do you have any outside activities that you're interested in? Um, yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm uh, working with the student council at, at the moment and um, just last Saturday I did uh, a play for the uh, Home School Association. Right, so you're so, a bit interested in yeah. drama. <laughs> yeah. A okay, all right, well uh, thank you for joining in the public debate on this uh, which is what Mike Thomason thank wants you. to happen now. Uh, that's Jonathan and Sally. Jonathan Jones who wasn't nearly in Harry Potter, Sally Hopkins.